You wrote an, an op-ed piece for the New York Times some, not too long ago, I think it may be two or three years ago, um, talking about your involvement with desegregation in the South. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I found that interesting. Um, there was well, a lot of reluctance in the South to, to finally... Well, here we had the Brown decision yeah. that basically said that segregated schools were to be a thing of the past. Yeah. And uh, I forget the date of the Brown decision. That yeah. was 19, a long time before Nixon was in office yeah. anyway. 1970 comes along and President Nixon decided there's seven southern states where the schools were segregated by law. You couldn't run yeah. an integrated school. That the time had come to end that. And what went into all his reasoning, I don't know, but that's, he decided that in uh, the early summer. And he yeah. appointed a cabinet committee to manage it. And he appointed the vice president, who was then Spiro Agnew, to be the chairman, and me to be the vice chairman. I was secretary of labor. Agnew said, I don't want any part of this. This <laughs> is not my issue. I uh -huh. won't even meet. Uh -huh. So I became yeah. the de facto chairman. Uh -huh. And I had, at that time, Pat Moynihan was in the White House and a guy named Len Garman. Oh, sure. Don Rumsfeld was head of the Office of Economic uh -huh. Opportunity. Anyway, was he? I didn't, yeah. uh -huh. uh, we went to work on it. And we decided to form biracial committees in each of the states. Uh -huh. And our object was to get what we call real people. Mm -hmm. That is not people who went around agreeing with each other all the time, mm -hmm. but people who represented constituencies and felt strongly about it and were good people, sure. substantial people. Yeah. So the first group to come up was from Mississippi, 50-50 mm -hmm. representation. So mm -hmm. they came into the Roosevelt Room in the White House, and I started in with them. And we started discussing the merits of what was going to happen, and they argued. So I let them argue for a while, maybe an hour and a half or so. Mm -hmm. Then I had it set up that when I thought the moment was right, the Attorney General, who was then John Mitchell, would come into the room. So John would come in. and I, I th the. White people in the South thought he was their guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Southern strategy. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, John, Mr. Attorney General, mm -hmm. what are you going to do when the schools open? Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to enforce the law. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> so then I'd say, well, it's been an interesting discussion. Uh -huh. <laughs> and everybody's had their views, but it's kind of irrelevant because it's going to happen. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. what's the question now? Well, the question, it seems to me, is how's it going to work? And you are a banker, you're in this town, and uh, if the schools go to hell and there's a lot of violence, it's not very good for your banking business. Yeah. And yeah. so on yeah. around. And so they start to talk about what kind of problems might arise and how would you handle them. Mm -hmm. We had a little money that could be used to build this or do that. Mm -hmm. And so they got discussing how you're going to solve a problem. And they'd get to a certain point when they were really working together and talking together constructively. Mm -hmm. And we'd get a signal and go across the hall into the Oval Office, and there's the president. And President Nixon was magnificent in these things. And he'd say, well, here we are in the Oval Office, and think of the decisions that have been made in this office. And mm -hmm. here we have this huge issue of education and equality in education. Mm -hmm. And I've made my decision. But in our kind of a country, it's not enough for what the president decides. People in the states and the communities, you have to decide too what you're going to do. And we have to do this together because mm -hmm. we all have a role to play here. And I'm with you, but you have to respond. And by the time he got through, everybody was up on cloud nine. Wow. So That's we went out and they worked. People don't know that. People, no, they don't. People do not know that. But then I got a scare mm -hmm. because there were seven states involved. 
We went through six, and it all went well. Mm -hmm. So I became very confident. And uh, I said to the president, why don't we, and the last one is in Louisiana. And it was about a week and a half or so before the school openings would start. Mm -hmm. So I said, why don't we go down to Louisiana and I'll meet with the Louisiana group and you can come in at the end and then we'll get the co-chairman of each of these committees from all the states to come. We'll mm -hmm. have a meeting of all of them. It'll be kind of a kickoff, mm -hmm. uh, goodwill kickoff for the yeah. opening of the school season. So he looked at Agnew who was there and Agnew said, Mr. President, don't go. They're going to be blood running all through the streets of the South and you don't want that blood on your hands. Mm -hmm. And the president looks at me, <laughs> I'm the non-politician in the room, mm -hmm. and I say, well, you're the president of the United States, whatever happens, it's on your watch. Yeah. And you've met with these people who've come up here, and they're good people, mm -hmm. and they're working. Yeah. So I knew he had decided to go, but anyway, so he decides to go. So we go goes. down there. Uh -huh. I go down the night before with Pat. And we work with the Louisiana group and it's not coming so well. And all of a sudden it dawns on me, it's one thing to bring people to the White House. To the White House, yeah. It's another thing to meet in a hotel room. And yes, yeah. so we were getting somewhere, but it wasn't teed up the way it usually was. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, the president has landed. The president's 10 minutes out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to adjourn the meeting yeah. and go to the president and say, well, Mr. President, I was before yeah. it was all teed up. Mm -hmm. But it's not teed up, and you've got to take it on and bring them around yourself. Yeah. Sorry about that. But he did. He did it very well. And then we had the meeting. It went mm -hmm. off well. And after the meeting is over, we get on Air Force One, and we're flying back to Washington. Mm -hmm. There was only one real Southerner in our group. It was a man named Bryce Harlow. He's a very wise mm -hmm. man. I remember that name. And... Uh, we're sitting talking about it, all feeling pretty good, and the president comes back from his quarters and joins the conversation. And then he turns to Bryce, the Southern, and he says, well, Bryce, how do you think it's going to go? He says, well, Mr. President, I think it's going to go very well in the South, not going to be a problem. The problem is going to be when it comes to the North, when it comes to New York and Boston in Chicago and all the people who have been preaching to us in the South. That's what well, he was right there. Be. <laughs> the president says, why is that? In those days, they called the Negro. Mm -hmm. Bryce said, well, Mr. President, in the South, we love the Negro. Mm -hmm. We live with them. Mm -hmm. In the sense, we hate them as a race, but we love them as human beings, and we're mm -hmm. with them all the time. Yes, Human contact is there. Yes. In the North, it's the other way around. They have no human contact. That's right. And yeah. they won't know how to handle it. That's right. Ted Price turned out to be very yeah. prophetic in that. That's right.